Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone. I do hope that uh, you can hear me okay. Maybe you can see me okay. We'll see. Um, we'll trust the Lord for connection issues, <laughs> uh, as for a lot of things in this season, right? Uh, but it really is a joy to be back with you all this morning virtually. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to preach God's word. Um, I want to begin today with a question, and it's an open-ended question, which is, you know, when you think of the Psalms, that book in the Bible, what primarily comes to mind for you? What's kind of the first association that you end up having with that book? Uh, for many, it might be the promises of the famous 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, others might think of the messianic promises scattered throughout the whole book. For others, it's the refrain of the hallelujahs throughout the book, the call to praise the Lord, all of creation. For others, it's the heartfelt cries of desperation unto the Lord that we hear from, um, from God's people. The Psalms is one of the largest and most influential books of the whole Bible. That's just one example of this. You know, it's quoted more than any other Old Testament book in the New Testament. So no matter how, you know, what comes to mind for you or how familiar or not you are with its contents, it's a book in our Bibles that's worth knowing about. It's worth pressing into for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the Psalms have been described as the Bible in miniature in some ways. God's revelation beautifully and briefly compacted into one book. And it's a book that's widely expansive, therefore, in the ground it covers, both in what it tells us about God and his plan of redemption, as well as the created order and the human experience. On just the question of what it means to be human, and particularly to be a believer in the midst of a fallen world, the Psalms, perhaps more than any other book in the Bible, appeals to and engages every single part of us and calls for a comprehensive response of heart, soul, mind, and strength. The further we get into the Psalms, the more we will see how they wonderfully inform our intellect, they arouse our emotions, they direct our wills, and they even stimulate our imaginations. The Psalms might rightly be called worshipful cries of the believing community. And for many Christians, they are precious and even a favorite portion of Scripture. But as important, as favorite, and as familiar as they might be, there, there are also things we want to admit that may still be very alien about the Psalms, if we're willing to admit it. Places where we don't quite understand what's going on within them. And the truth is the Psalms can be quite intimidating to the uninitiated between the poetic devices, which maybe many of us are straining to remember from our grade school days, how does poetry work, right? To their cultural distance from us. Some of the Psalms were written as close to 3,500 years ago in some cases, right? So these are worshipful cries of the believing community. They're powerful agents of encouragement, challenge, and change if we properly understand them and allow them to do the work they were intended to do in our hearts and lives, not just in the hearts and lives of God's people many, many years ago. They're part of God's living and active word for us today. And so my hope is that today we can learn more about the strange word of the Psalms so that what is foreign can become more familiar. And in the process, I hope it'll kind of serve as a, a warm invitation to come and drink deeply from this wonderful portion of God's word. I want to kind of be an, an advocate for the Psalms today uh, for you. And I want to do that by looking at this first Psalm, Psalm 1, as a sort of appetizer for each of us to dive more deeply into the Psalms, especially in this season of COVID-19, where we might have a lot to reflect on in terms of what's happening in our lives personally, and a lot more opportunity to more frequently feast on the goodness found within the Psalms, both individually and corporately. So that's what I'm hoping to do some today. Please pray with me as we begin uh, that work. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every single portion of your divinely inspired word and how each part graciously reveals your character, your acts of power and grace. We ask that you would use this time in the Psalms today to bring your word alive for us the Spirit would illuminate your word before us and that we would be changed by it. May your word be the living waters for us that we read about in this psalm. And may we re 
join the voice of your people through the years as we take the words of the psalm upon our own lips and ears. And may we respond with humble adoration and steadfast faith. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Okay, so Psalm 1, uh, the gateway to the Psalter. I want to begin by simply passing along an insight that students of the Old Testament have increasingly recognized in recent years, which is that the first two Psalms are unique in that they provide kind of an initial orientation to the Psalms as a whole, a sort of posted notice as you enter into the vast forest ahead. Psalm 1 and 2, but especially Psalm 1, uh, is understood as a gateway into the rest of the Psalter. So today, I want to look at that first Psalm and ask the question, what sort of orientation then does it provide? In what ways does it help us understand how to read and live in light of this book? And ultimately, what we're going to see is that Psalm 1 serves as a kind of guard for any who seek to enter in the book and take up its worship or cries. As one scholar put it, Psalm 1 seeks to protect Israel's sacred hymns from abuse. For before entering the Psalter, one must give a hearty amen to the most basic presupposition of the book, that God blesses those who delight in his law and commit themselves to covenant loyalty, while the opposite prevails in the case of the wicked. Indeed, Psalm 1 and 2 together expound a uniform message, which is this. The righteous faithful are fully rewarded, and in the time of judgment, they will triumph over the wicked. That's the title I've given in the sermon today, Two Ways to Live. Later on, we'll see there's actually a third way I want to talk about. But for now, two ways to live, ultimately for those who seek to utter the hymns, spiritual songs within, we're called to see how divergent are the paths of the righteous and the wicked. In fact, this is our main idea for today that I want us to focus in on. Before we can fully take up the Psalms as our own, we must recognize the stark contrast between the righteous and the wicked and where their paths ultimately lead them. So we see this at the very beginning of the Psalm in verses one to three, which show forth first the way of life. Look again at verses one to three with me. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of, my, of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now we know from the very first word here of this entire book, blessed, that we're talking about the way that leads to life. Blessing is one of those words that can become religious lingo. You know, Christianese, we sometimes call it. Maybe you've seen hashtag blessed out there as one example of the ways we, we use this term, but we often don't really know what we mean by it. And that's true if we don't intentionally remember that this is simply a word that communicates divine favor. Someone who is blessed is someone who is experiencing divinely ordained joy, flourishing, even happiness in life. The person being described here, one of God's faithful people, one of the righteous, is blessed. And that blessed life is described in three primary ways here. The first is a negative description. This is a person who doesn't participate in what can probably be best understood as three varying degrees of departure from God in the life that he calls his people to live. The blessed one does not walk in step with the wicked, nor do they stand in the way that sinners take, nor do they sit in the company of mockers. The digression that seems to be in view here is, is going from keeping the company of those who are not righteous, but in fact wicked, that's the walking image, to engaging in the behavior and ways of life that these wicked people participate in, that's the standing, to finally having an established heart attitude that is set against God and is found most intensely in mockers or scoffers. That's the sitting. 
In fact, the digression is strongest at the end for scoffing or mocking is the most fatal of attitudes. Scoffers are people who are defined by their heart attitude as being the furthest from repentance and the path of the righteous. Now, why is that the case? Well, let me just ask you, have you ever met someone who really could be described as a scoffer when it comes to the things of God? Think about that for a second. Have you ever encountered someone that you think really belongs in that category? This isn't just somebody who doesn't believe or has had some bad experiences with the church, maybe. This is somebody who mocks God and has unbelievable disdain for the faith. They are the furthest from God in the path of life for the simple reason that any time the name of Christ is mentioned or the gospel is even hinted at, they mock the entire message and couldn't possibly think of entertaining its validity. And so this digression from bad to worse to the worst is something that the man who is blessed, the man on the path leading to true life, avoids at all costs. Instead, what defines the blessed person, the person who's flourishing under God's favor? What is their delight? It isn't anything close to what delights the wicked, the sinner, or the mocker. It's in fact the law of the Lord upon which he meditates. That is, he carefully reads and reflects on it day and night, all the time, again and again and again. It's habitual. I was having a wonderful conversation with someone about Psalm 1 recently, and I was so refreshed when, you know, they just came out and asked me, and said, you know, what, is ex what exactly does that mean? What does the law refer to here, this thing we're supposed to be delighting in? Well, what does that mean? What is that law? I was happy to share with them that the answer has a couple different levels to it. On the one hand, the term for law here became a shorthand for the law of Moses, for the law that God had given to Israel when he rescued them out of Egypt. And so law can refer to something as specific as any one of the commands that God gave his people, which set forth how they were to live as his righteous people, laws that Jesus summarized in the two greatest commands of loving God and loving others. But on the other hand, the same term at times is better understood as instruction. And this helps us see that the law here ultimately refers to every word of instruction and revelation that God has given to humanity. In short, this is a person who delights in every word that comes from the mouth of God, he wants to study it and learn it and act upon it at every turn. What will that kind of blessed person with that intentional avoidance of the path of the wicked and a sheer delight in the instruction of the Lord look like? Well, we have a wonderful image given to us here of that person as a tree planted by streams of water. This is such a common image given to us in Scripture of what the way of life looks like, what the life of the righteous faithful can be described as. In contrast to the cursed bush of the wasteland, the blessed, those who trust in the Lord, are like a tree planted by rivers of life-giving water. The tree yields fruit rather than withers in hard times because of its proximity to the source of life and prosperity and refreshment itself. The church I formerly pastored down in Florida had as its logo this exact image. A tree growing luscious leaves and bearing much fruit because it had deep roots in the life-giving water of God's word. And I don't know that I could come up with a better image or a better logo to constantly have before the believer and before the church. You know, this image of a tree, it was, it was a constant reminder and even a call to this church. Let's be like this tree planted near the life-giving stream of God and his word flourishing because of it. Not because of anything we did, but because of our proximity to God and his life-giving word. It was a call for the church to strive to experience the blessing that comes from being a Psalm 1 tree, yielding much fruit rather than withering, regardless of our external circumstances. How? By being intimately, organically connected to the giver of life itself. Isn't that what Jesus talks about in John 15, being connected to the vine and everything coming out of that life? There's nothing that's flashy or immediate about this growth, by the way. 
In contrast to the seed planted on rocky ground, which thrived initially but then failed to endure because of shallow roots, this is an image of quiet, long-term growth that flows out of our natural connection to God and thus transcends the ebb and flow of different seasons that we'll all experience in life. The point is not that we will flourish in a flash and far less that we will experience material prosperity of the sort that prosperity gospel hawkers speak of. No, the idea here is that in the midst of famine, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of trial, in the midst of oppression, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of unthinkably horrific circumstances, we will quietly endure and even grow in fruitfulness. Certainly, there will be times and seasons where there will be more growth than others in the Christian life. There's no question about that. But that long-term trajectory for the true believer is one of slow and steady growth and maturity, like a tree. Why? Not at all because of our own doing, our own capacities, our own righteousness. Can the plant that's only sustained by the life-giving water really boast? When I go out and water my plants on the patio, can they really boast in their ability to thrive and flourish? No, it can only testify to the life-giving nature of the water that I provide for it, life-giving water. Church, when we think about growth in the Christian life, do we have this as the primary image that comes to mind for us? I think it should be. This psalm paints a picture that for us as believers, planted by life-giving streams, we will be growing in Christ-likeness, slowly but surely. And this psalm also reminds us that that very image, that such growth comes about inevitably by his grace for those who are connected to him as branches connected to the vine. It may be quiet. It may take place over years and years, so gradually that no one could ever pinpoint exactly how it happened, right? Can you point outside and say, I can see exactly how this tree grew from a little seedling to this giant oak? No, but nonetheless, the growth occurs. By the grace of God, we grow from an acorn or a mustard seed into a flourishing, healthy, life-giving tree. That is a picture of the way of the righteous. That is a picture of the way of life. And that wonderful image that's given to us is what moves us into the inherent contrast which must exist with the wicked. For their way is not the way to life and flourishing and blessing, but is the way to death. We see this way set forth in verses 4 to 5. Look again at those verses with me. It says, The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. It's so appropriate that the psalm is briefer in this section. Did you notice that? Because it's part of the poetic device of the psalm that this description of the wicked in their way is much more abrupt. While the blessed are described in language that flows and communicates an ability to last, the wicked in their way are described in short spurts that pass away immediately after they're uttered. And the contrast couldn't be stronger here. The NIV begins verse 4 with, not so the wicked. <laughs> Unlike that tree that endures, they're like chaff. That's the husk of wheat that's tossed up on the threshing floor for the wind to blow away from the life-nourishing grain that remains. In short, the wicked are rootless and useless, producing nothing that actually nourishes. Instead of being a fruit-bearing tree, they're ultimately blown away and good for nothing. What's very important to see here is that in the same location and the same circumstances in which the righteous endure and even flourish, in the same location, same circumstances, the wicked perish. This isn't just true in this life. It's also true and actually even more true in the life to come. Any earthly flourishing and endurance or wilting and perishing, which we witness now, is actually an image, a significant precursor 
of the eternal destinies which await the two groups. Essentially what we have in the psalm is the setting forth of the ultimate destinies of the righteous and the wicked, of which we get these sneak previews of here in this life. But those ultimate destinies stem from the fact that one has simply continued further on to one of only two pathways that you can walk in this life, the path that leads to true life or the path that leads to ultimate death. And that's part of why verse 5 points us to the day of judgment, when the assembly of the righteous from all of the created order will finally be established forever. We need to be pointed beyond the happenings of this earth because, well, as the rest of the book of Psalms testifies to in spades, things aren't currently the way they're supposed to be, are they? See, one of the things the psalmists honestly struggle with again and again as we head into the book is what it means when we actually see the opposite of what is set forth here in Psalm 1. We behold the wicked flourishing and the righteous suffering and perishing. For one really powerful example of this, I encourage you this week to go and read Psalm 73. There, Asaph, the choir director for the temple, grapples with the fact that he sees the arrogant and ungodly around him flourishing, while he, a man who is sought to walk in the way of the righteous, doesn't seem to be flourishing at all by comparison. Asaph is wrestling with the same thing we all wrestle with in one way or another in this life. Why does it seem like the wicked are flourishing like water-supplied trees, while the righteous are withering like dried-out chaff? This problem is exactly why we need this orientation here in Psalm 1, this stake in the ground as we enter into that territory. We need a reminder as we enter into the full, this book full of heartfelt cries unto God about these unjust things that are out there. The, the cry that he's abandoned the believer, that he doesn't seem to care if the wicked are prospering, that these things are not ultimately true. We have to acknowledge that in a broken world, things aren't always what they seem. It may appear in a certain hour of darkness that the wicked are thriving and happy while the righteous are the ones dying on the vine. But ultimately, the day of judgment will come. All wrongs will be made right. All confusion as to which path leads to life and which path leads to death will be more than cleared up. For in that day, the wicked will not be able to stand up in the midst of God's refining fire of judgment. In that day, their fate will be a chaff-like fate, blown away into oblivion to experience death in the deepest sense, eternal separation from the life-giving waters that the righteous drink from and find life in forever and ever. What a sad state. And finally, in verse 6, we see that ultimate parting of these two mutually opposed ways set forth clearly and utterly. It says there in, in this capstone, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord does indeed look with loving concern upon his people, caring for them in the midst of the various trials that they go through and bringing them ultimately to a land of abundance and rest. And right there, we have a call to believe that, to trust that. Do we believe that this morning? This is from God's word, church. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. We have to struggle to believe that. He sees us. He knows our way. But the wicked were promised that their way leads them only to death and utter destruction. That is the end result. Each reaps the eternal fruit of what they have sown in this life. And at the end, there's no escape hatch. There's no alternative path or third option to take. At the end, there's no buying their way out of a jam or trivializing what they've done. You see, at the judgment, there's no way to bribe the judge or naively trust that they've been good enough in comparison to other people. There will be none of that. The judgment which will come is sure, it is just, and it is final. I mean, this is as black and white as it gets, right? 
Psalm 1 is trying to make it absolutely clear there is no neutral ground to take. One is either a part of God's righteous people walking on to life, or one is a part of the wicked enemies of God who will one day eternally perish for their rejection of him. Now, our society and our culture would tell us there's absolutely no way this could be the case. What a, what a horrible vision of an either or. You're either for God or against him. How could all these nice people out there really be enemies of God? But this is what God's word sets before us as the truth of the matter. And it sets forth that this decision, this most crucial distinction, echoes through all the way into eternity. So we see that our lives here are certainly then not trivial or to be mocked or scoffed at. On the contrary, what we do with the life that God has given us is staggeringly important and decisive. And so I, I want to ask each of you today, do you feel the pull and the urgency of Psalm 1? It's so easy for things that are so familiar for us that just we hear them and the words just bounce right off our ears. But can we stop and really feel the significance today? of the starkest of contrasts that's set before us in this psalm. Do you hear the important word of orientation that this psalm provides us, not just to this book, but even an orientation to the entirety of what Scripture testifies to again and again and again? In some ways, you could use Psalm 1 as a gateway into the entire Bible, you know? Take someone to Psalm 1 as a first stopping point and say, you know, you know what the Bible tells us? There's really only two ways to live in this world. There are only two ways to live, two paths that one could walk on. The path that leads to true eternal life and the path that leads to the worst sort of death imaginable. The Psalms presume from the very get-go this polarizing view of the world and of the human race. In that way, the Psalms agree with Jesus himself when he said, you know, there are only two roads, right? The wide road that leads to death and the narrow road that leads to life. There is no third option. One has to choose. And so as we close today, I'd like us to reflect on what we do with these two ways to live. How do we respond? And obviously the question that should jump right off the page at us is this, which path then are you currently traveling on right now? Is it the way of the righteous that leads to life or the way of the wicked that leads to death? Are you find yourself thinking perhaps, well, I, I'm, if I'm honest, I might be on the path to wickedness, but you know, one day I'll, I'll, I'll make that change. One day I'll pivot over right, right in time. We have no guarantee of that. In answering this question, I think we all need to be careful a little bit. We need to dig a little bit further and ask, you know, what does it actually look like to be on the path of life versus being on the path to death? One of the things I found helpful in this is drawing on some of the work that Pastor Tim Keller has done, which is to see that there's actually not just two, but ultimately three ways to live. Stick with me for a second. Because you see, the path of the wicked is actually a two-pronged path with equal but opposite departures from the path of righteousness, or the gospel path, as Keller would call it. The first of those false paths is the one that we typically associate with the wicked, the path of lawlessness and irreligion, the path of outright rebellion against God and what he said in his word, the path of the scoffer and the mocker. We know that part of the way to death very well, I think, and it's to one often testified to within the Psalms. People who are utterly throwing off religion, the claims of God, and mocking anything having to do with him. But what we often forget is the other prong on the wicked path. And that is perhaps quite surprisingly, the path of religion, the path of legalism and religious observation. It's the path that says, I will be righteous and make myself right with God by what I do, by my rigorous keeping of the law. That's how I'll pursue the path of the righteous, the path to life. And while the first prong of this path is often spoken about in the Psalms, this second prong of the wicked's path 
is the one most frequently spoken about and rebuked in Jesus' earthly ministry. Again and again, Jesus strained to communicate to the scribes and the Pharisees and everyone who thought they were good with God because they had kept the law and they were way better than others, especially those tax collectors and prostitutes, that these people were in even greater danger than the outright pagan and the hardened sinner. Why? Because these people used a cloak of religiosity to convince everyone, including themselves, that they were among the righteous and thus on the path to life. And to them, Jesus had some very disturbing words. Among them being, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have actually not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Repentance, truly recognizing that we are all on the path that leads to death. And that we must all therefore turn away from that path by grace and place our faith in the Savior whom God has sent on our behalf. This is the way and the only way to the path of life. Jesus calls each of us to recognize that when we read about the wicked being like chaff and being blown away into eternal death at the judgment, well, guess what? That is all of us apart from the grace of God. If we are on the path of life, it's only because we've been rescued by the work of God's Son on our behalf, having done absolutely nothing to earn or deserve that work. Church, we must see that both of these paths, the paths of irreligion and religion, keeping us and will always keep us from experiencing the flourishing and eternal security that comes in the path that leads to life, the gospel path itself. Tim Keller says it this way, both religious and irreligious people are avoiding God as Savior and Lord. He says both are seeking to keep control of their own lives by looking to something besides God as their salvation. Religious legalism and irreligious relativism are just different forms of self-salvation. You see, on the path of religion, you're avoiding God as Savior because you're trying to be your own Savior. And by so doing, you'll never delight in the law and the lawgiver in the way that we must for you to experience eternal life. But on the path of your religion, you're avoiding God as Lord because you're trying to be your own Lord. And by so doing, you're missing the call of the law and the lawgiver to a life that's pleasing to him. And guess what? According to our own tendencies, every single one of us would fall into one of those two categories and thus continue to walk on the path of the wicked that leads to destruction. What hope do we have to be able to actually leave that two-pronged wicked path and turn to the true life found on the righteous path? The answer is found in the one that the book of Psalms continually points us to again and again and again. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Israel's anointed one. He's the only one who could be a savior for those who couldn't save themselves and who could be Lord for those who couldn't rule over their own lives in a way that leads to a delight in and obedience to the instruction of God. Our only hope to be among the assembly of the righteous, the only way that we can truly claim to be walking on the path of the faithful that leads to life, is to bow the knee to the only one who has ever walked that life of perfect righteousness for us and suffered the consequences of our own wickedness and sin on our behalf. Our only hope is repenting of our religion or irreligion and turning to Christ, believing that by his death and resurrection, he has saved us from the way of death and set us to walk on the path of life, rescuing us from the judgment of verse 6 and enabling us to experience the unbelievable flourishing of verse 3. That's a picture of the flourishing of the Christian by grace. We see this hope before us throughout the whole book of Psalms, but the day I want to ask you, what path are you on? Is it the path of self-salvation or self-rule that leads to death? Or is it the path of righteousness that comes by faith and leads to life eternal? Psalm 1, as the gateway to the Psalter, forces us to grapple with that stark contrast and insists that we give it a hearty amen before we take up the worshipful cries of the community found within. I hope that even today you will reflect on the truth that, at the end of the day, 
there really are only two ways to live. And only one of them leads to life. So church, in this season of COVID-19, where we have perhaps more time to consider the paths that we walk and where they are ultimately leading us, I encourage you to receive this orientation and enter further into the Psalms with it. There you're going to see writ large the flourishing which comes along the path of life in contrast to the withering that's the inevitable result of the path of death. And when you see this and repent from the way of the wicked and perhaps anew join the path of the faithful, be sure to give praise to God as the one who has graciously given you this insight and enabled you to find that way to ultimate blessing and life itself. Let's pray for help in that church. Father, we are so thankful for your word, which is so clear in a world full of false claims and naivete and a unwillingness to face the facts and to speak soft truths we are so grateful that your word is true and is the proper orientation for us in this life. So, Lord, I pray that today your word would do its work in us, that this orientation in Psalm 1 would indeed remind us and cause us to reflect on which path we are on. If we are on the path to life, that that is by your grace, and we'll give you praise and thanks and pray for your sustaining grace to make it all the way home. And if we are, in fact, on the path of the wicked, perhaps unknowingly, bring that to our attention. Do a work in our heart to enable us to see that and then to repent and trust the Savior and begin that journey on the path of life. May we also be ambassadors of that path everywhere we go in every conversation we have this week. I pray for your church to be the witness that you've called it to be to this pathway of life amidst the suffering and death that is going on in this world. Do your work in us, we pray. We give our hearts over to you and you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.